家好，我是主持人饶顺。今天做客我们节目的嘉宾是来自哈佛大学物理学教授、知名物理学家、美国光学学会主席、荷兰皇家科学院院士，同时他还是 PI Peer Instruction 的创始人 ，Mr. Eric m a z u r 先生，有请。Hi, Mr. m a z u r welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Could you please say hi to the audience? Yes, absolutely. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I just landed in Beijing 20 minutes ago, and my first stop is right here in the studio. Excellent. Why? It's such a privilege and honor to have you here. The pleasure is mine. <laughs> How long have you been teaching in Harvard University? Well, that's a long time. I started teaching in 1984. I was wow. at Harvard since 1982, so 35 years. Wow, that I've been teaching time. for 33 years, and I've come to Beijing for 30 years. My first visit was exactly 30 years ago. I see. So compare the visit that you had in Beijing 30 years ago with the visit you're having now. What differences have you found out? It's a completely different country. <laughs> in fact, each time I come back to Beijing, and I come very often, it changes completely. I, I can't believe it. It's a very exciting time for China. So you have come back to China or visited China oh, many times, right? Many, 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 many times. I see. Can you name one thing you like most about China? Well, I love the entrepreneurship, the, the spirit of uh, change and innovation. I see. That's also related to what you're doing. You always like to do like come up with some very innovative methods of teaching? I comp constantly try to rethink the way I teach. I see, I see. And also, I know you, you invented uh, peer instruction. That was kind of uh, fundamentally changed the traditional way of teaching in the class. And it's widely used globally. Right. Yeah. Can you tell right. us how did that happen? Absolutely. You see, when I, when I started teaching at Harvard, some, uh, what was it, uh, 33 years ago, mm -hmm. I, I simply started teaching the way my teachers had taught me. Which was? Right? Lecturing. <laughs> lecturing. Right? Standing in front of the classroom, talking to my students. Mm -hmm. And um, I was teaching physics mm -hmm. to medical students. Medical students don't want to learn physics. <laughs> they have to learn physics, oh. but they don't like it. So that's most a problem. of my, that's a problem, <laughs> yes. So most of my colleagues didn't want to teach that course because the students were not very kind to the physics instructor. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, my students liked me. Mm -hmm. They liked me as a lecturer. So they gave me very high ratings at the end of my semester. And I very quickly thought that I was the world's best physics teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, that turned out to be an illusion, <laughs> a, a pleasant illusion, but, but an illusion. So it, it took. I think seven years mm -hmm. before I found out that even though my students liked my lectures, they were not really learning. Oh. They were simply listening and taking notes. Mm -hmm. So instead of the knowledge going into their heads, it went into their notebooks. Uh -huh. So after about seven years, I tested them. And I tested them using something that was really, really simple. Not using equations, not using drawings, simply using words. Just words. Words to express ideas in physics, ah. yes. Mm -hmm. And I found out that, you know, probably 60% of my students were unable to express in words even the most basic principles. They had memorized the equations, mm -hmm. they had memorized how to solve problems, mm -hmm. but they really didn't understand it. In yeah. fact, when I, <laughs> when I gave that, that test for the first time to my students, one student raised her hand and she asked me, Press Mazur, mm -hmm. how should I answer this question? According to what you taught us? Or according to the way I usually think about these things. <laughs> They're totally separated. <laughs> and I went, wow, you know, what's going on? And, and it became clear that, you know, it was just a, a, you know, a house of cards. It was just a complete illusion, mm -hmm. right? I was transferring information to them and they were transferring the information to their notebooks. But they did not really understand. They're not the transferring basic. to the brain. The they were not transferring. They, they were memorizing it mm -hmm. so that they could pass the test. Yeah. But they were really not internalizing it. Oh. And so you know that was for me an, an amazing discovery. I went, wow. You know, yeah. I thought, 
I was a really good teacher. And now I'm discovering <laughs> I'm a really bad teacher. So I started to rethink education and I realized that education is not just the transfer of information. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a student, as a, as a learner, whether it's in the classroom or at home or online, mm -hmm. you need to extract from the information the knowledge, yeah. the mental models that permit you to do something with that, that knowledge, do something new with that knowledge. Exactly. And that was not happening in my classroom, even though I'm at Harvard. Harvard, right? I mean, one of the most selective universities in, in, the, in world. the world, mm -hmm. right? So I realized that, you know, education is really a two-step process. Two-step process, right. what are they? The first one is transfer of information. Mm -hmm. right? The second one is that the learner, the student, has to do something with that information, mm -hmm. has to assimilate the information. Mm -hmm. And I've always asked myself, you know, where did that second step, the making sense, the, oh, I get it, oh, where did a, that happen, right? Aha moment. That <laughs> aha moment, exactly. <laughs> and I don't think that many aha moments happened in the classroom, it happened after class. After class, exactly. But if you ask yourself, which of those two steps, information transfer, assimilation of the information, which is the easy one? I think we'd all agree it's a transfer of yeah, information. Yeah, it's just the easy listen one. and take notes. Yeah, so it's kind everybody of everybody can do that. Right, right, right. And plus, we have books, we have video, we have many ways of exactly, transferring information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of ironic that in classrooms all over the world, U.S., China, Europe, Africa, South America, Australia, everywhere, mm -hmm. professors in front of the class focus on the information transfer. Whereas we have so many other ways of transferring information. Yeah. And we good. should really help the students with the second step, with the aha moments. Yeah, yeah. So I decided back then in, in I think it was 1991, to mm -hmm. flip that, to essentially, rather than focusing on the information transfer in the classroom and then giving the students the responsibility for the hard part, I was going to give the students the responsibility for the information transfer, mm -hmm. read a book, watch a video, whatever, mm -hmm. and then in class, I use the time to help students have the aha moment. Aha, uh -huh. exactly. so very good. The, the way that's really I flipped the totally. whole process. That, that's yeah. where the flipped classroom started. Yeah, oh, yeah. very in good. In 1991, wow. so in my classroom. So I, um, I essentially decided in the classroom not to teach by telling, but to teach by questioning. Uh -huh. right. So what I do is, is I, I walk into the classroom, mm -hmm. I talk maybe a few minutes, and then I put a question on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I read the question with the students. And then I tell them, think about this question for two minutes. Mm. But usually before the class, they were required to We'll, we'll talk, read. About, we'll talk oh. about that later. That's right. They have to have read oh. or watched something before class. They have to be prepared. You're totally right. Great. But let's first talk about the in-class, and then okay. later we'll talk about the out-class. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I give them, the, I, I project the question, they think about it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I have them make a commitment. They have to choose an answer. If it's a multiple choice question, mm -hmm. you know, before there was technology, I had them put their hands on their chest, indicating the choice. So I said, at the count of three, everybody vote one or two or three, right? Uh -huh. Or four or five. And so everybody votes, and I can sort of see the distribution of, of, of answers. Mm -hmm. Then later, we started using clickers. That's how, I don't know if you've ever seen little clickers. There are several Chinese companies making clickers now. Yeah, it, sta yeah. it started actually in Hong Kong from an alum of our, our school and then, you know, then spread to the spread US and then, and then recently in China. But now we use, uh, we use smartphones, right, for yeah. the students to answer or draw something or type oh, something. So that's so, kind of, you, yeah. you invented this. So they make, they make this um, commitment mm -hmm. and then I tell my student, find somebody near you who has a different answer. So let's say I turn to the person on my left with the same answer. 
Mm-hmm. No, yeah. turn to you. I choose you, three. You, you choose one. three. I choose I'm two one. or one. Exactly. <laughs> so we start talking. So we start talking, and and you say, why did you choose one? And I, I have to justify right. myself. And now you have to externalize your answer. You have to externalize your answer, and no, it becomes no longer about the answer. Mm-hmm. It becomes about the reasoning that leads to the answer. Yeah. Now That's let's say that you are right and I'm wrong. Right. You're right because you understand it. I'm wrong because I don't understand it. On average, you will be more likely to help me than the other way around. Yeah. So at some point, I'll probably go, oh, yes, right? I'll have that aha moment in the class. Mm-hmm. From so you have peer. Yes, from your peer. That's why peer <laughs> instruction. Yes. That's right. So you, you have to imagine, you know, like two, 300 students all talking to you. Chaos, okay? Complete chaos. Yeah, very loud, and lively. Very, very loud, <laughs> lively, exactly. Not just two, you know, like yeah, here. Yeah. And, um, you know, as an instructor, I just walk around and I can see these aha moments, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the real key point is this. You, Alan, are more likely to convince me, Eric, mm-hmm. than Professor Mazur in front of the classroom. Why? Because you've only recently learned it. You mm-hmm. still know what the difficulties are that the beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago. You know, to him it's so yeah. clear. That it's so easy why you're struggling. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Why you're struggling. It's so simple, you know. <laughs> it's so simple once you understand it. Yes. If you don't understand, it's not that simple. You forget your own learning. Yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues calls it, calls it the curse of knowledge. A curse of knowledge. The curse <laughs> of knowledge, right? Because you tend to think, the more of an expert you are, the better your position to teach it. Yeah. But in a sense, we forget, right? We forget our own struggles. Yeah. Anyway, so ideally, I try to aim my questions so that initially between 30 and 70% get it right. Mm-hmm. If less than 30% have it right, there are simply not enough students to teach other. Mm-hmm. If there are more than 70% of the students who get it right, then it's going to be hard to find somebody with a different answer. Mm-hmm. But if between 30 and 70% get it right the first time, mm-hmm. at the second vote, you know, it'll shoot up to More than 90%. 90%. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty amazing. It's wow. pretty amazing. And, you know, and then that cycle repeats throughout the entire Until they get 100% class. correct yeah. answers. Yeah. Do you know who had that, that idea first? I thought, you? No. <laughs> Confucius. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, from China. Yes. <laughs> yes. He said, whenever there are three people together, there's bound to be one who can teach the others. Wow. And, 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 yeah, that's yeah. the Chinese. And, and, wow. and, and, I'm and, amazed and, that you know this. Of course I know that. <laughs> Actually, in wow. Western culture, yeah. there was another philosopher who said that, uh-huh. which is Socrates. Mm-hmm. The Greek philosopher Socrates said, we should teach by questioning not by telling, yeah. right? And then somehow, you know, over the course of the last 2,000 years, we've gone to these large auditoria and we have people teach by telling. Mm-hmm. But the problem is it goes in one ear and comes it's out. All the other, other ear. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully it stays between the ears long enough to pass the exam. <laughs> pass the exam, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just not right. But yeah. still I can see that many um, students are kind of learning in this way. I mean, they really oh, need Oh yeah, this, so this is the beauty of it, okay? The beauty of it is that um, people have testing. I started that, of course, but you know, I was the innovator, so you may not believe my results. I showed that, you know, the learning gains tripled. Okay. Wow. So if you measure students' knowledge on the first day of class and you meet, measure it again at the last day of class, in a traditional setting, the gain was relatively low, mm-hmm. but after peer instruction, it tripled, 200% increase. Wow. Right. Yeah. So that made me very excited. I started talking about it, mm-hmm. then other people started to use it. And they went, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's then, the way it shall be taught. Right. And then they went from <laughs> physics to astronomy to chemistry. And, you know, it's amazing. Now, now there are people all over the world at, at uh, Beijing Normal University. They have professors who are doing research on peer instruction. It's pretty impressive. Oh, by the way, mm-hmm. in 2000, um, I don't know, I think it was 13 or 14, I forgot. The first international conference on peer instruction was here in Beijing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. And there were, I think, 300 people who attended that, uh, 
I have conference from all over the world. Excellent. You kind yeah. of, you made a difference in the well, teaching world. Look, must be proud. In all fairness, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm proud about it. But, but in all fairness, I didn't, I didn't start thinking I'm going to change education. Mm -hmm. I had a problem in my class. I said I have to solve this problem in my class where students are not learning. And I was very surprised to see that, you know, it's like it, a it, snowball effect. Yes, right? yes, in the end, it yes. changed the world. Yeah, that it's was like amazing. Big things begins with uh, small things. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's been now what twenty seven years. Wow. Yeah. And also reminds me of a quote that I really love about teaching. It's like it says, "Education is not a feeling of a pail, but lighting of a fire." Exactly. That's exactly what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing is this, and and I think every every teacher knows this. Every teacher knows this. Mm -hmm. The person who learns the most in the classroom. It's the teacher, because in order to teach it, you have to internalize it. <laughs> yeah. right? And I think that, that many teachers around the world have taught a course because they wanted to learn the subject. It's the best way of learning the subject. Yeah, yeah. What peer instruction does, it gives students an opportunity to, to become be a, a teacher. teacher. Yeah. Yes, exactly. exactly. Wow, very good. I, I really agree with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally agree with you. That's amazing how the peer instruction changed the, the, the classroom and also increased the efficiency right. of, the, of the learning on the teacher's part and also on the student's side as well. Yeah. Right. right. So yeah. you, you mentioned earlier, and I think yeah. you know, maybe we briefly need to talk about that, is that this approach requires students uh, yeah. to, to be responsible for the information transfer. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a peer instruction class without any preparation, it does not work. Mm -hmm. So you have to prepare yourself before. So the trans information transfer has to happen before the class. Right, but, 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 but we have great tools for mm. information transfer. First of all, we have the book. Okay, yeah. Right, for hundreds of years we've had the printing press and, and, and the book. Mm -hmm. So one thing would be to have students read the book before coming to class. Yeah. The second thing is that we have many recorded lectures. Yeah. Why have the student go to a live lecture if they can see a recorded lecture? Yeah, right. on, on that is on open courses. We've, hey, got, exactly. we've got thousands of recorded hey. lectures, hey. open courses out there, free for everyone to watch. Perfect, <laughs> right? I mean, that's perfect. Why reenact a course if it's already available on NetEase or any other, any other platform? Yes. And you see, watching it online has a, a benefit. Yeah. See, if you're listening to a professor in front of the class talk and talk and talk and talk, and at some point your mind says, wait a minute, do I understand this? Hmm. And your mind wanders, mm -hmm. you're no longer listening. You cannot listen to the professor in front of the class and think. Oh. So you suppress your mind's tendency to, to think. And you think, oh, oh I'll, I'll think about this later, let me listen. Right, mm -hmm. because students will not raise their hand in class and say, "Professor, please be quiet for five minutes. I need to think." <laughs> right. But online, mm -hmm. you can pause yeah. the speaker and hmm, mm. think. Let me go back and watch it again, or Maybe let me go back, or, me or let me look better. this, let me look this up online, or or, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that for the information transfer, we have really good tools. Yeah. The big problem is to motivate the students to do it. Mm -hmm. And to do it, when I say to do it, means to not... To finish it? Right, right. If you're a student mm -hmm. and I tell you, read chapter 22 in my book, then what guarantee do I have that you and others will actually do it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so one way would be to, you know, have a, a stick. You know, if you don't read the chapter, I'll hit you. I'll hit you. <laughs> right? And have a little test. But I don't like sticks. I like carrots. Right? And the carrot is, you know, if you read the chapter and before class you ask me good questions, then in class we'll address those questions. So I have my students read and annotate the chapter electronically online. This can be done with video too. Oh. You should consider using that in your open online courses. 
Good. We, we should talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay, <laughs> good. So right now we do it with print rather than with video, but the technique that we use is, is, is perfectly uh, transferable to video. Mm -hmm. so, so, so essentially, I have students interact with each other asynchronously online on the printed text ask questions, answer each other's questions, mm -hmm. and then the unanswered questions come to me. Mm -hmm. And then in class, I can take my students' questions and put them on the screen and have them think about it and then have the aha moment and teach each other about it. So now I connect the information transfer out of the class mm -hmm. with the sense making in the class. Yeah. And I found that that worked really, 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 really well. Yeah, yeah. I really, I really like that idea and also I'd love to be in your class. You got taught in this way. Come on uh, over and visit. <laughs> By the way, that's true for anybody. If you want to come and visit, be yeah, my yeah. guest. Please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just, um, um, unfortunately, I think in, in my study experience, I was more like the, the old traditional way to do Me too. In, in Me too. When I was a student. Me too, which is why I started teaching that way. Right? I mean, it's natural. We all do. We're all product of the old system, and, and therefore, yeah. that's what we do in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We long for a change yeah, exactly. in the classroom, and uh, exactly. thank God you made the change yeah, for us. Yeah. yeah. So we're really grateful to you. You know what? Actually, in the, in the last few years, I've changed things again. Again? <laughs> yeah, well, the last five years. I haven't spoken about like it very you, much. You upgraded? I, yes, yes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I realized that what I had done is taken something that's broken and tried to fix it. Yeah. Peer instruction allows you to take a large auditorium class mm -hmm. right, with all the students facing the instructor. Yeah. Or even an online course with you know, the audience facing the lecturer on camera. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, that, that, and, and make yeah. that interactive. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that, you know, Essentially, what I had been doing to my students, I'd been taking the book and I told them, here's the book, learn it, it's good for you. Mm -hmm. right. But you know, most of my students are not physicists, they're, they're, they're pre-medical students, they're, they're engineers, uh -huh. they don't want to learn physics, they want to do engineering and medicine. It's just physics, right. physics is something is, they have to do. Physics is just a, a, a hurdle that they need to overcome. <laughs> so when I tell them, learn this, it's good for you, they think I'm crazy, I mean, why would this be good for them, right? It's just a, it's just a, a barrier to their degree. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that's probably not the best approach. And I decided that I was going to completely change it. Mm -hmm. So I changed the learning space. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But I also changed the way the content gets presented. So rather than telling them, here's the book, learn this, it's good for you. Mm -hmm. I tell them, we're going to work on some exciting projects. Mm -hmm. and, and I designed the projects in such a way that they have a component of social good or empathy, a way to improve the world or a way to improve the environment or a way to, mm -hmm. to help uh, an yeah. entity or have a people. bigger purpose, right. bigger goal. Exactly. Yeah. And the physics is not obvious initially. It's just this project, right? Mm -hmm. Like exploring other planets or, or building new musical instruments for poor countries or things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then once the students are really excited about the project, mm -hmm. I tell them, here, you may want to have a look at this book. It can help you with your project. <laughs> so rather than making the content of the course the end goal, mm -hmm. the content becomes a means to accomplish your a goal. goal that's much more meaningful in the mind of the student. Very right. good. This like way they learn the physics not because I tell them to learn the physics. No, they learn the physics because it helps them to do something that is fun or interesting. Meaningful or in their life. Exactly. Yeah. So physics is like the necessary tool that exactly. you, can, you can use to help you accomplish your obvious goals that exactly. you like. Yeah. Exactly. And if they're medical students, I try to connect it to medicine. If they're engineering students, I try to connect it to engineering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, and, and, and these projects, they do them in teams. Mm -hmm. So rather than having the students sit in rows facing me, they sit around tables in groups of five. Mm -hmm. And that creates a social responsibility for the learning. Because mm -hmm. I make sure that the projects are so difficult 
that not a single student can do it alone. Right? Oh. Let's say you're the best student in the class. Right? Mm -hmm. If you get the normal curriculum, you may s look at it and think, oh, I can do this. Right? Mm -hmm. If that happens, you don't need the other people in the team. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that it's a lot harder. So that when you look at it, you think, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, it's, uh, how, how am I going to do this? <laughs> and we look at it and we think, oh, Alan, can you do this? And Alan says, no, I'm not sure. So we need each other. Uh -huh. We all need to do our part in order to manage to do it within the limited yeah, time. I see, the teamwork, right? right? right. Everyone exactly. contribute from your own perspective, from your own knowledge. Exactly. Now, let's suppose that I'm part of your team, mm -hmm. and each class I come half an hour late, and <laughs> I don't do my pre-class reading. Mm -hmm. The we four of you are going to be you. unhappy. Yeah. We will feel, gu go, you feel guilty I'm, for exactly, being late all the time. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it gives a social responsibility for the learning. Yeah. So uh -huh. rather than being responsible to the teacher, mm -hmm. students become responsible to each other. And I found that that combination of project-based learning and team-based learning completely changes the attitude of the students. Mm -hmm. Rather than, you know, working to memorize and pass the test. So that's passive learning. And rather, and rather and then competing, you know, against each other. Oh, mm -hmm. And think about it, the way we work in society, the way you work here at NetEase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't work alone, you work in teams. As a team, right? yeah. And you have to learn how to work together. Exactly. On the other hand, education is completely focused on the individual. We do not prepare our students for society the way we should prepare them. Mm -hmm. right? So those two changes are, are more recent. I still do interactive teaching, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of interaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's, it's become even in a different learning space. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you were to come to my classroom... I'd love you one day. Well, <laughs> I, I promise you one thing. Mm -hmm. When you leave, you will think, Eric Mazur teaches kindergarten. <laughs> because it looks like it's a fun. kindergarten. <laughs> because it's fun. Yeah. It's fun, yeah. and oh, the good. students are having fun, and they're talking to each other, and they're working together. And Great. this is it. They are solving problems, real problems. Yeah. Learning yeah. is supposed to be fun. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Learning, look at small children, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they learn fun. fast, and they have fun. And they want to learn. They're yeah. not learning. They're not learning because the teacher tells them, you must learn, learn this or I'm going to give you a bad grade. No, they're learning because they're curious, because yeah. they want to learn. Initiate the learning, because right. that's something they want to do. They love doing it. So right. that's when the real learning happens. Right, and interesting you mentioned that, right? Because small children learn intrinsically, and then we go to elementary school. By the time we go to middle school and high school, we don't learn intrinsically, we learn because of the pressure yeah, of yeah. tests. And then we get students in, in universities, like the, you know, the excellent universities you have here in China, or my university, and the students are not learning because they're interested in learning, no, they're learning because they have to you know, pass the test in order to get a degree. Yeah. Then they leave the university and they go to work, mm -hmm. and they rediscover the beauty of learning on their own. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm sure you and your work, you keep learning. Mm -hmm. I and my work, I keep learning. Exactly. I don't learn because I have to pass a test. Mm -hmm. I learn because I want to learn and advance my career and improve my, yeah. my performance. That's where my interest is also. I get a lot of pleasure from learning. Yeah. And I'm sure that with your open courses, that yeah. the happiest learners are those that are taking these open courses because they want to. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. because they have to. There's a need. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of the strange. That, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of strange that in education, we start learning by wanting to learn, and then we take that desire away, away. Mm -hmm. and then finally at the end, people can rediscover the beauty of learning for learning's sake. Yeah. It should always be that way. Exactly. So right. there's one part in between that's kind of wasted. Yeah. Totally. And needs to be. Totally changed. Yeah, shaken up. I, I, I yeah. totally agree. I love that word. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And, also, and that brings me to another question related. You know, right now, online learning is uh, getting more and more popular. Right. And uh, according to, the, to your instruction, you mentioned about peer uh, instruction, is um, most time you uh, apply that, practice that offline in the classroom, right? Right. But if you, if you do some online learning, there may be millions of people. Right. watching the video at the same time. Right. 
how can you apply peer instruction? So, so I've thought about that a lot, right? I mean, mm -hmm. look, initially, computing used to be individuals interacting with the computer, right? I mean, yeah. from computer games to to internet searches, to online learning, you name it, right? It's, yeah. it's individuals connected via a line to the computer system. Yes. Mm -hmm. And not individual connected, but no interaction between the people. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Then, you know, there were some multiplayer games where different people get to play with the computer, but they interact because they see each other through the game. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that more and more we get um, a move away from individual computer users with a central system to users interacting with each other. For example, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I'm sure you have, you have similar things in, uh, in China, like um, I think there's this, this thing called Mechanical Turk in uh, an Amazon where essentially you crowdsource problems. And, and people interact with each other solving problems. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of research showing that when people interact with each other with a computer system, they accomplish much more than when they're individual. Mm -hmm. So I think that in online learning, the next step is to make people... Interact. Interact. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same thing with the teacher teaching a standard lecture in auditorium, mm -hmm. where even though the students are sitting next to each other, they're not interacting with each other, they're all focused on the teacher and peer instruction where it's not just the teacher, but it's also students' interaction. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can bring that idea mm -hmm. either synchronously or asynchronously to the internet, it will revo revolutionize online learning. Wow, yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I'm convinced. I think that Porting that idea to video is going to tremendously increase the engagement and also the benefit of online courses because now it's not just me watching a screen, it's me watching a screen asking questions or um, seeing questions from other students and interacting with these other students. I see. And that yeah. also will help um, increase the, like the finish rate. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. because now it's not, oh, I don't no, understand no, this, I'm lost, yeah. but you know, it's, I don't understand it. Oh, Alan can help me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And we try, to, um, we try to connect that with social media. So here in China, we use WeChat and mm -hmm. China Weibo to connect users mm -hmm. that already know each other. Yeah, yeah. So if you're taking an online course and I'm taking the same online course yeah. and we're friends on WeChat, or we, then, or eat, or then we're automatically we automatically connected so that you know we know that we're both using we're both using the, the same course, course. Yeah, right. yeah and right. we're kind of also internally competing with each other okay you finish uni the next video I have to also go, maybe, go to the same level as maybe, you maybe 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 although I try you know the the problem is I really want to make the learning experience collaborative mm -hmm. I, I prefer to promote people's empathy. To, people's, people's, to, to promote people's desire to help each other mm -hmm. rather than, you know, let me get ahead of you. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I want to put the focus on helping run the competition. I try to minimize competition. I see. Very difficult with Harvard students. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, Harvard students have competed very hard in order to get to Harvard. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? They, all their life, all they've done is use their elbows to push themselves ahead. Yeah, get into yeah. I have to be better than right. others. So I have I to get be better selective. than everybody else, otherwise I'm not, I'm not going to get into hybrid. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I tell them, stop competing, help each other. Yeah. It's very difficult for them initially. Very good. Yeah, it's a different mindset, totally it's, different mindset. It's a different mindset, but, but, but think again about how society operates. Mm -hmm. right? Society operates not on individuals. Mm -hmm. Society operates mostly on groups and people working together in teams. Mm -hmm. Why does one, one company get more successful than another? Because it has a better infrastructure of people working together. Mm -hmm. So I think teaching our students at all levels, primary school, secondary school, post-secondary school, to work together is probably one of the most important skills in order to succeed in the 21st century workplace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. The teamwork really as long as you have a very good infrastructure of teamwork to get the best of your team members, individuals, then right. that can be really 
helpful and powerful. Right, as long as you contribute to the team, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. And, and look, I mean, um, I can make a long list of people who were very successful, mm -hmm. but dropped out of college or high school, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we can make a long list, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, you name it, I'm sure China has its share of dropouts that became successful. Yeah. And if I think back of my high school, I mean, I had quite a few classmates who always had the highest grade, A, 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 or 10, 10, 10. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know where they are now. They would, even though they had high grades, they're, they're, you know, I don't know where they are. So clearly, what education measures is not an accurate predictor of future success. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's not just the individual performance on a test that will determine whether somebody becomes, you know, Jack Ma or Charlie Yidan or, or Steve William Job Ding. or exactly yeah. Yeah. or Einstein or whatever. I think Einstein wasn't that great a student mm -hmm. in college at all. And we was, you know, we, we can make a long list of that. Yeah. So I think that education is too much focused on the individual mm -hmm. and not enough focused on the teams team. and groups. Yeah. Wow. I predict that's the next breakthrough in online learning. Very good. We're looking forward to seeing that happening. Good. On our platform. I guess that would <laughs> definitely will happen. Be happy day. to work together to make that happen. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all those uh, innovative ideas and that really enlightens us. Well, my pleasure. You know, every university has um, has like a, a motto. I know uh, Yale has this motto, if it's translated into English, it's uh, light and truth. Uh, is that a motto at uh, Harvard University? Ours is much more simple than Yale. It's just... Light it's and uh, truth is already really simple. <laughs> Even more simple. Truth. Just one word, truth. <laughs> truth. <laughs> yeah, so, so the motto is Latin mm -hmm. from the ancient Romans, veritas, which means uh, truth. So oh. in other words, you know, pushing people to search the truth. I see. Uh, and that's how this applied at the Harvard? You see, Harvard, I don't think many people realize this, but Harvard is a relatively small university. We only have 6,700 students. 6,700. Mm -hmm. right. That's less than the people who are working at NetEase. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. At the undergraduate level. Right? Uh -huh. Harvard is much bigger at the graduate level. At the graduate level, we have about 19,000 students. So, oh, I see. so at the PhD level, we have many, many more. So a very big focus of Harvard is research. Mm -hmm. And that's true for you know, other universities like Stanford and, and Berkeley and Yale and Caltech too. So a lot of focus is on the PhD level research, mm -hmm. on advancing knowledge mm -hmm. by seeking the truth yeah. through research. So I think the term Veritas, I don't think that was the original intent of the founders of Harvard or whoever came up with that motto. And I don't know the history of the motto very well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you know a lot of this seeking the truth takes place at the research level rather than the teaching level. Mm -hmm. So before we finish up here, do you have any other words you'd like to say to your audience? Well, you know, I think if you're, if you're a student, the important point in life is to really always remain that, you know, child you were when you were four years old and keep asking why, not, not being satisfied if you read something or hear something you don't completely understand. If you don't completely understand it, it's not your fault. It's the fault of the person who has written the words or mm -hmm. who, has, who has recorded the lecture or is telling you the lecture in school. And you should immediately raise your hand and ask the question, why? And I think by continuing to act like a small child, mm -hmm. you will go very far in life. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much My for pleasure. taking the interview. My and pleasure. I can really learned a lot from you. And also, I really like the part that I mentioned about asking questions. That's kind of like to, to have the, still have the curiosity like a child. Right. right. That can really help you make sense of things and also create new things. That's when and where the innovation happens. By the way, yes. the word for knowledge in, in Chinese 
the word for knowledge. 学问. That means asking questions. Oh yeah, yeah. 学问, learn and asking questions. Learn by asking questions. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>